everyone will gas up the characters that are always anti-government and capitalism just to buy 2k again every year. <laughs> the same people that will condemn Biden or Trump but praise Naruto becoming Hokage for a village that thrived from war profiting and treated him like dirt up until he was the last person that could save them. Oh brother, this guy stinks! I am a big fan of stories, regardless of the outlet in video games, books or movies, the fantasy which I lose myself into with these worlds is an addiction I bring to reality. So when I see these very things in reality, it helps me identify the correlation between what I see in real life versus what I see in fiction. It's natural to make these correlations because art imitates life or life imitates art, I don't know, like one of those two. And in understanding that, whilst doing research, I stumbled upon this pretty thought provoking quote. To revolt means to spill your blood first before the blood of your enemies, but since you value your own blood more and knowing what comes with that, you will spill no blood at all. A harsh reality to embrace, especially when you consider the factors of privilege and geographical relativism, but even then, when I made that quote up, I had to acknowledge an additional layer of hypocrisy that lies beneath. The age we live in is full of faux beliefs, nonsensical divisions, rudimentary conflicts, and of course, hypocrisy. But amongst all of this, there is something which I find very interesting when it comes to projecting the many dismays we have in regards to many of the constructions in this world. When we look at the world of fiction and the laws which build these amazing fantasies, part of the appeal that draws us into these worlds orbit around the imaginative tales of the what ifs. What if you were a space wizard roaming the galaxy with a light sword? What if you were a cowboy looking the bank on your next big school? What if you were an octopus that had a human wife and human kids? Okay, what? The beauty of these artificial worlds is in the phrase, the fact that it is artificial. You don't have to do anything, but you can be anything. There is no real life commitment you have to these landscapes outside of the ones which are either self or community imposed and even then the latter is of optional dedication. Because of the novelization of these fictional universes, it's almost like any opinion, belief, idea, religion, political affiliation and seemingly everything else under this category is an outlier to your real world identity. In my video, Why You Want To Be Evil, I discussed how we project and look to assimilate certain characteristics of more morally ambiguous or flat out reprehensible characters. Characters that embody ideas that we would never look to adopt in our real lives due to reasons that stretch off far into the distance. Those characters don't just serve as a fictional representation of whatever the story is trying to elaborate on, but they also serve as modes of our own psychological projections and ideologies made true. They live in ways we cannot, and therefore, we take the parts which serve to be the most practical to us. This is the furthest thing from uncommon. People have their favourite characters as their personas and avatars everywhere, prison company included of course, and we're able to identify them and understand all of them. However, where I make a divergent point comes from not our association with the characters as portrayals of who, to a certain extent, we would like to be or emulate, but the entire concept of that fictional world itself. A lot of people that love Batman and everything he is wouldn't dare put on the mask and walk around Detroit at night fighting crime. I mean Gotham. However, many condone his actions if a man existed as many wouldn't. Again, this is on an individual outlook, not a collective goal or governing ideology. So what if we looked at someone or something that stood against everything many people hate? Someone like Monkey D. Luffy, for example. The greatest depiction of a freedom fighter we've seen in Eastern media. He leads an unhinged crew of liberators on his quest to become the Pirate King. We see the Straw Hat crew go from various islands and countries during his quest and they make him known that they are in fact a very anti-government and dictatorship rule. From the Marines to Arlong, Dolph Flamingo, Kaido and more, any antagonistic force that threatens the sanctity and freedom of the masses they will stand against without second thought. Made very evident early on in the series when Luffy had Soga King burn the Marine flag and when he decked the Celestial Dragon upon his headpiece. It also adds to the point of Luffy's identity further when you discover he shares the same birthday as Marx, which I don't think is unintentional. When we understand One Piece's deeper level of it being a political statement against corruption, slavery, autocratic governments, fascism, and secret society, we develop a deep appreciation for the story and those that fight in advocacy for what they represent. It inspires us to also look at those political and social antagonistic forces as irredeemable, no matter who's on that side. Y'all will never ever make me like this op. But when we see this in real life, when we see people act out against oppressive regimes or contentful governments, our response is usually that of 
reluctant compliance. Hey, no, stop, just calm down. There are verbal protests, showcases of digital activism, and even peaceful protesting. However, none would ever reach the degree we would see in One Piece. Sure, it would be fallacious to do a direct comparison as to why a revolution in One Piece will not translate well in real life for obvious reasons, but if we are so enamored by a fictional idea of freedom, then why do we succumb to our own fictional sense of freedom? Predominantly in countries where we don't have to worry about mass uprising, deplorable military and police rule, and civil war. Right? Where little by little we see laws being legislated to ensure a struggling lifestyle for those that live below a certain percentile. Why is it that the same love we see for the forces of more anarchist and even socialist ideas waver when it concerns our real livelihood? On the topic of pirates, just look at how they're represented in media. In real life, pirates are not these pillars of social justice trying to make the world a better place. They're criminals with very heinous intentions among society. Whilst Pirates of the Caribbean shows us the greedy nature of pirates and how they're not really good people, when in contrast to the antagonistic force of the Royal Navy, we show more sympathy and fondness towards the former. They're written in a way where, while they are pirates and many of them are contemptible, we favour them over the government. Intentionally written in a way to activate this bias. We see the same notion with George Orwell's Animal Farm and the gross depictions of capitalism, spirited away with its symbolic messaging of greed and gluttony, Hunger Games where the high class society thrive off of watching the survival of those in the poorer districts, the Fire Nation in The Last Airbender, the Templars in Assassin's Creed, and the list goes on. The protagonist or the side we often root for is one which is against, in truth, capitalist and right-wing ideologies. We're hardwired to detest the oppressor in fiction and root for the revolution because that's what they constantly depict as the driving antagonistic force. So when liberation and ideas of anarchy or at the very least anti-conservative and right-wing philosophies are shown heavily in media, why is the same rule not applicable in real life? In ancient Athens, Socrates was seen as a man who was renowned for his wisdom and mentorship of others, famously Plato. Due to his ruminations about life, religion, and philosophy, he was charged with corrupting the minds of others and a saber, which was the desecration and mockery of divine objects, translating to impiety in English, because questioning the wonders of the nature of the divine was considered a sin. Consequently, he was soon sentenced to death by way of drinking poison. Whether or not the motivations behind his demise and prosecutions were either religious or political is something that is still debated in academia. However, before his demise, one of the concepts Socrates had a strong disdain towards was the inadequacy of democracy. Believing it to be a form of government where it would ultimately lead to tyranny by consequence of ill-suited men and governors due to them having both access to excessive power, wealth, status, and giving everyone the right to rule. Especially given the city-state of Athens, its smaller size post the siege from the Spartans would make it so the leaders would have a more direct democratic rule with its citizens as opposed to much more representative one. Representative ones we see in modern times. The democratic man would evolve into a tyrannical man, and then the tyrannical man would eventually be murdered or flee. This would then lead into anarchy, chaos unorganized, which would later give rise to a council to elect a new leader to ensure their anarchy will rest. Only for the cycle to repeat again. To him, the excessive ubiquity of liberty is the downfall of man. A democratic society in its thirst for liberty may fall under the influence of bad leaders, who intoxicated with excessive quantities of the neat spirit, and then, Unless the authorities are very mild and give a lot of liberty, it will curse them for oligarchs and punish them. Liberty ungoverned leads to a disabled order, a repeating cycle which leads men unable to see the path of clarity for the betterment of all people. Even with Plato's alternative, his preferred route of assigning the ruler of a state to be that of a philosopher would strictly be one who would educate and lead the state. A criticism of this is that it would result in a state where there is a lack of individual personality, a potential obstruction to social development that is not in direct correlation to the progression of the state. In that case, liberty comes with a strict evolution of the state. This is my first argument from a philosophical perspective as to why we would embrace a stronger sense of government and authoritative control in real life. Socrates discusses the practice of how a democracy would lead to tyranny, but this doesn't work in the practice of the modern age. With the evolution of technology, politics, and other social factors would render the ideal state impractical by sheer size alone. But let's say, even in a contained space where the population was one where it could be more of a direct rule as opposed to representative, the execution would still fall victim to disorder and even revolt. The action required to do such a thing, to even be such a person, this philosopher king, requires an ideology that in this day and age does not have the strength of character to measure up against. 
Do you really want to dedicate your life to the objective aesthetics and notions of practical government? Would you really want to be led in a society where entertainment and liberties aren't conducive to the overall state are prohibited, for even for enlightenment? That would mean no music to the degree we're seeing now, or video games or movies that would illustrate any notions against this inline cause. However, in knowing this ideal state cannot function, the substitute would then be to romanticize one which would work both in subjective fondness and objective nature. We can only fulfill that if you decide to be a fair ruler when playing Fable or watching Aang free the Earth Kingdom from an oppressive regime. So it ties back to living vicariously through these mediums for a sense of satisfaction or catharsis. In knowing the responsibility that comes with having to lead a government, state, or even a country, be it individually or through a collective, it requires a sacrifice of individual liberties to ensure and maintain state liberties. It's very understanding, especially in this climate where you will have those that are in favor of democratic or republican ranked governments that are docile to whatever decisions are made that may benefit the minority more than the majority, even if their compliance is one of reluctance. More often than not, the majority are placed in a position of having to pick a forced choice as to who will represent their country, even if both choices are bad, with conditions to pick which is the least bad between the two. But this isn't as simple as picking the less of two evils. We know governments under capitalism predominantly are very slimy and legislates bills and laws which are always met with pushback, especially from the younger generation. However, compared to developing countries or countries that are under totalitarian rule, we do have a lot of freedom. Relatively speaking, you can listen to whatever you want and watch whatever you want, an authority you wouldn't have in other places. In knowing that, it makes it come into the reality that a bunch of old men that strictly care about advancing their lineage and interests far less contemptible than feeling like you actually have to take action. Now, this isn't to say that we keep our protests strictly within our fictional realms, there are those that take action to their own hands. For example, when a bunch of people thought it would be smart to go ahead and storm Capitol Hill because Republicans couldn't accept the fact that Trump wasn't re-elected. In a protest that came at the expense of five lives being lost and over two million dollars worth of damages, safe to say, while it showcased a level of rebelliousness that you'd think was lost among this age we live in, they still recalled back into the comfort of their lives. Similar appeals have happened with the George Floyd protests as well. A gallant effort against racism was shown, but never the underlying issues where racism comes from, resulting in the menial changes such as white voice actors relinquishing their roles because they suddenly feel to be out of touch amongst the controversy. However, the lack of an organized movement in mass scale rendered the protest, which, four years later, can be seen as just another notch in the phenomenon that was 2020. Be in the same family! Viruses come and no, stop family. touching niggas with Don't your head! Man. This is to say that destroying an established order, one which is built up from the blood of those in servitude, will always come second to our own freedom that they provide for us because of how much we fear the outcome of failure despite the greater numbers we have. The risk when evaluated against the action hardly seems worth the effort. As humans, we are already born with this unchanging instinct of survival, the need to eat, drink, sleep, rest, and overall performance to ensure that, innately, we see the next day. Everything beyond this, many would argue, is nurtured by society. We don't need to fight unless prompted, we don't need to revolt unless there's a driven reason to do so. These factors are not relative, however, as they differ from where you are born and the circumstance of that society you are in. So, when you are faced with corruption and or other modes of social, economical, and or political functions that threaten our livelihood, how do those, usually in environments where our freedom isn't a constant state of turmoil, channel the feelings of frustrations and angst? Sigmund Freud, the most famous figure in Western psychology, and arguably psychology in general, proposed a theory that socially unacceptable actions, urges, and desires that are initially seen as immoral are later transformed into urges and impulses that are socially accepted and sometimes lauded as a defense mechanism known as sublimation. This transition is through a string of changes, from a psychological point of view where our experiences when absorbed morph based on how we interpret new information. For example, if someone was SA'd at a young age, that lack of control and sexual bondage can cause someone to live a more hedonistic lifestyle where they engage in more carnal activities more than usual in order to regain that control that was stripped away from them when they were young. Sociologically, to what would be accepted and mass public to be then condemned, if you use the F slur in abundance years prior to publicly speaking against hate speech for example. This transformation of usually bad to good for the individual would serve as the basis of this concept. I strongly believe this has a similar case to the same capacity when it comes down to how we use and analyze fictional media when compared to the real world events, and here's why. From an early age, the school systems indoctrinate a conformist ideology among its students. Unknowingly or not, 
not in the means of capping the student's potential, as that's a different topic entirely, but a means of functioning within the society and the history that is taught that further installs this idea. History taught will cover the basic and bare minimum of slavery and world war, often showcasing a very skewed perception of the victors and losers on each side. For example, when I was in school, what I was taught about slavery was like a kid's pop rendition of it. I was told slavery was bad because no one should be treated that way, but not because of how it rendered black people to be viewed as less than subhuman commodities. I was told it was bad because slaves worked insufferable hours in the plantations, but it was only later on in life I found out that they would use their skins as leather for their clothes. It was presumed when slavery ended, it just ended and that was it. Not knowing the grueling back and forth and those that defended the necessity of slavery because many nations had nourished their economy on it. So with its abolishment would come the economical shortfall of these countries. But when slavery was abolished and when the Abolition Act of 1833 was put in motion, it only provided partial emancipation to those less than 6 years old. But those that once were retained for up to six years as apprentices. And then the British government agreed to a £20 million compensation package towards the slave owners as damages for lost property. But this is the same empire its citizens are supposed to be proud to be a part of, and they enable that by deciding to omit what would be beneficial for children to know when they're most impressionable. Another example would be that of the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Rachel Zane. To the world, it was a hallmark of extraordinary wonder, but to British students, their academics throughout that period was in honor of the royal family. A nationalistic approach to that, through years of programming, ingrains the idea of blinded patriotism, for something that bears little to no relevance to them will be met with loyalty and admiration. But the same students will ask, why should the British involvement with the Middle East have anything to do with me? By the time they are of age to where that national bias deteriorates, you embark on your own journey of knowledge and what the world really is. You see your truth. The evils of British colonialism, the nation that profited the most by virtue of the transatlantic slave trade, the idea that the British Empire, its influence, and its long-standing spree of liberty it offers its people makes any discourse of true significance ineligible in the eyes of the ordinary citizen. Despite your contempt, your protest is in silence. Then here comes a game franchise known as Assassin's Creed, we can be a part of the creed which dedicates this pursuit in eliminating the agents of corruption, evil, duplicity, and everything mentioned beforehand. Call of Duty, where you can wage your war fantasies, why we're so enthralled by the performances of Heath Ledger and Aaron Eckhart in The Dark Knight and how we see their point of view, especially that of the Jokers. The physical action of revolt and protest is to be met with dire consequences, so they have made in a growing and continuing mass fictional outlets to where the realities of fighting against the minority is feasible. I would also speculate as to why so many of these outlets promote a anti-government narrative to further constrain the masses from being too overly exposed to the real world. Because even to where your forms of escapism are just constant reflections of the politics you're surrounded by, that morale, your people, who have nothing at all. And someone who has nothing to lose but everything to gain is a dangerous person. So we must always have something to ensure we do nothing. In movies such as The Purge and Sorry to Bother You, we see graphic depictions of what a greedy and capitalistic surplus can lead to, an elitist man's desire to have the proletariats kill each other. I won't say that all fictional works has that type of discussion to where they concoct a plan to make a piece of work represent a certain type of way for the means of compliant programming, but it's ironic how the more anti-capitalist movies are being, the movie industry remains heavily capitalistic, so there eventually will come a point to where we stop looking at these movies just to preach the message they continue to ingrain over and over again. That this shit is only good from a distance, as a dream, and nothing else. And you, consumer, will keep it that way. Or else. Right. Or else what? What if everyone just decided to heed these warnings and stop going out to the movies? Stop using streaming services to further establish that point. Stop giving on to these capitalistic ventures and industries. Stop supporting NBA 2K to where they make you spend hundreds of dollars every year into creating a character build that you cannot take with you into the next game, have you buy that exact same game at retail price, then make it so you have to do the exact same thing again on a yearly basis, making you forget you're in a voluntarily quasi subscription based cycle by buying the same thing all and over again with the next to no changes, but persist because this franchise has no competition in sight, so it will feed both off of your desperation and ignorance. At that point, the amount of money you invested into playing digital basketball, you could have been good at real life basketball. I'm not saying you should feel some type of way when you consume this type of media from this point on. 
No am I saying that all media should be viewed in this lens. Some people just want to make things from the passion and desire to make it, and I understand that. But I do just find the correlation between the what is and the what ifs to be increasingly more interesting given the events we are all witnessing. There is no greater way to make sure the people of your state don't turn your backs on you if you give them something that they should not feel like they need to work to have, which is their freedom. A free man isn't born into freedom, as the institutions that man sits upon are morphed by the entities and forces that tell him what freedom is. They are born into a definition that they cannot change, but will have to spend their whole life looking for reasons to reject the oppression that they have been distorted to view as opportunity. So when they show you what real freedom looks like, we then persuade ourselves into thinking, it could be worse. And that's when they get you. And that's why we're still here. Well, we may not be free, but... At least we can become Elden Lords! Yeah, go to put the pussy for with the shell talk. Yeah, go stop a bitch at the Henry. Yeah, go Henry. Party you with the no ho. Yeah, go the fuck on the gun. Henry. Oh, hey, Antoine. Oi, oi, oi. I don't even want to ask why you were singing that, but hey, you know that video guy you told me about last week? Oh, you mean that Uzuma Reductor Day? I'm. I ain't even gonna address that one. But yeah, anyway, yo, what on the street is that he has a Patreon now. Boy, <laughs> blimey, say swears. Yeah, and on the Patreon, it's like three different tiers. You can get exclusive content and behind the scenes footage and bloopers, and uh, you can even like ask him some crazy shit. So what? If I ask him, uh, the, 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 don't ask him that. Don't ask, don't ask anyone that. But yeah, you know what I mean? There's a little tier package go over there. You can go ahead and support your boy. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna go get paid next week and pay more money. I don't even know what you just said, but go ahead and support your boy. That's all I'm going to say.